and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But we hear, I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fattest calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Amen. And from the same chapter in the Gospel of Luke, we hear the conclusion of this morning's parable. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf 
for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. All thanks and praise be to God for his word. May God add to our hearing this day his blessing that we may gain greater understanding. Amen. One of the things that we do on a regular basis around here at Covenant Presbyterian Church is that we count and keep track of things. And we're very good at it because we're Presbyterians. And Presbyterians like to keep all things in the right column and make sure we know where everything is placed. And, and we talk about that a lot. A lot of our energy here is spent doing exactly that, as if our whole reason for being is to count and to keep track. So on Monday morning, we have a whole volunteer group of counters who come in bright and early for the sole purpose of counting the offering. And a little while later, Mary Calloway, our accounts receivable person, comes in and she checks signals with the counters and then she goes to work after they've counted because every last penny that they counted has to make sure it goes into the right category, make sure that it goes to the right person who gave what. And so we've got a whole team of people who count what comes in. And then on Tuesday, our accounts payable person, Jean Ann Gogarty, comes in and she pays the bills and counts everything going out. And it so happens that this time of the year, getting through the summer, that Jean Ann counts higher than Mary does. <laughs> that's why we're having a stewardship Sunday this Sunday and next. But we do more than count the dollars and the cents. Barb Heflin's job is chief counter and track keeper. She has to keep track of all the members, the coming and the going, and it's a fluid kind of a thing. So every session meeting, the number's different, what our total number of membership is every month. We know a running total, and it's her job to keep track of that, but it's her job to keep track of a lot of other things. You know, uh, uh, communion days and special events and get them all recorded. and and keep track of all the statistics that go with the life of this particular church. And of course, at the end of the year, the General Assembly sends out this, this, this year-long report that she has to fill out, and she's got to keep track of all kinds of weird statistics because you never know what General Assembly is going to ask for. And you, we can't figure out why they ask for half the things they do, but by gosh, we've got to write it down and get that report to them. So we keep track of that stuff. And on any given Sunday, during worship, I know if my sermon is clicking or not, because you see, Doc White counts all the heads in worship. And if my sermon isn't going well, Doc decides to start counting while I'm preaching. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> Oh, you're quicker than me, Doc. <laughs> you know, it was just a couple decades or so ago, the whole church growth fad was really big. And I remember it. It was sort of towards the beginning time of my ministry. And basically, you know, everything, the message that you got was everything you had to be measured by numbers, you know, what, what your membership was, what your attendance was, and churches and, and ministers would measure their success according to these numbers, because that's what the church growth movement told you you had to pay most attention to. My only problem was two things, actually. I was a rural pastor. There's a limited number of people out there, okay, so you can count so high and you're not going to go any higher. And I was also a rural pastor in Minnesota, a Presbyterian rural pastor in Minnesota, where everybody's Lutheran. So the problem is, is that there really is a ceiling 
in terms of what I could see for church growth because everybody else, else in town was going to the Lutheran church. And in fact, the Lutheran pastor behaved as if that was the place to come. I remember a ministerial association meeting one time where a number of us ministers were sitting together in a meeting and the Lutheran pastor, who was in charge of the biggest church in town, because everybody was Lutheran, said, you know, I really don't, why, I don't know why we need to have all these other churches in town. After all, everybody could come to the Lutheran church. We'd all be fine. Well, the rest of us wasn't so, were so crazy about that comment. So the bottom line is that we do a lot of counting and keeping track in the Christian life, which I guess that's part of being an institution, and it's okay, I guess, but it makes you kind of wonder, when Jesus said to his disciples, go and make disciples, what did he mean? Did, did he mean that we're supposed to wind up at the pearly gates someday with a statistic sheet? and prove that we did that through the numbers that we can produce? And the other th one thing I wonder is that in the New Testament church, in the book of Acts, when they told people who were joining the church that they had to give all their possessions to the church, did they get a charitable deductions tax letter? Because it seems like we won't give unless, we, unless we're able to take it off on our taxes. That's how we count and keep track as well. And so, what is all this counting and keeping track, and is it in line with who we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus Christ in the world today? Today, I'm going to challenge you to think of the parable of the prodigal son in a dramatically different way. Not that the old, old way of interpreting it is wrong, but the genius about parables that Jesus told is that they can be dealt with and interpreted in many different ways and give us all kinds of messages as to how we are to behave as children of the kingdom of God. And what I'm going to share with you actually comes, don't put it up yet, thanks. <laughs> what, what I'm going to share with you um, comes from a Jewish New Testament scholar, a Jewish New Testament scholar, by the name of Amy Jill Levine. And she's, she is an Orthodox Jew, and she teaches New Testament. She's the professor of New Testament at Vanderbilt University Divinity School. And what she does in that role, and she's well known by many of us who track those things, um, what she does in that divinity school is she teaches basically Protestant Christian students for ministry how to think of the New Testament with a Hebrew mind. Because after all, it was written in the context of a Hebrew world, and G Jesus, after all, was Jewish. And so she tells her students, you need to think of these texts with a Hebrew mind because sometimes your middle-class white European upbringing doesn't tell you the way it really was meant to be in the telling of the story. And she does this with the prodigal, the, the, the story of the prodigal son. And I want to show you now what she says about that. This parable, she says, is usually seen as a story of how our Father in Heaven loves us regardless of how despicable our actions. This is a lovely message, and I would not want to dismiss it. It is not, however, what first century Jews would have heard. Jesus' Jewish audience already knew that their Father in Heaven was loving, forgiving, and compassionate. Go ahead. Luke prefaces this parable with two shorter ones, the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. These parables are about counting. The shepherd noticed one sheep missing out of a hundred. 
And the woman noticed one coin missing from ten. And they searched, found, rejoiced, and celebrated. In doing so, they set up the third parable. The prodigal son story begins. There was a man who had two sons. Notice the narrowing of the numbers in these three parables. It begins with a hundred, it goes down to ten, and then it goes down to two. In the telling of the parable of the lost sheep. Now, think of it for a minute. The shepherd has a flock of a hundred sheep. He knows that. And what he does is he counts every one. And he realizes he has 99, but there's one missing and he's got to go find it. It's not that he kind of overlooks the herd and it kind of looks like a hundred and if I'm off one or two, uh, close enough. That's not how the shepherd behaves, although his numbers are in his favor even if he lost one or two. No, he lost one. And he had to go looking. The woman had nine coins, and that wasn't close enough either. She had to sweep through that house and keep looking through that house until she found that one was lost. And then you get to that father who has lost track in one way or another of both his sons. It really is a story of a father losing track of his sons and having to double back and pull that back in. You, you can interpret the prodigal son parable as the father being God and us being the sinful person and God accepting us back with grace and love, and that's fine. But as Amy Jill Levine points out, for the, for the Jews that he was telling the story to, Jesus had something else to say, and the father is us. The father is anybody who lives in this creation and loses track of things for whatever reason that may be. And we know the story of the prodigal son. The father basically loses track of the younger son because he's not, he's not disciplined enough to tell his son no at the very time the son says, liquidate your assets and give me my portion. I want to get out of here. And the father gives in to that desire. And by so doing, by giving him his share and letting him go, the father loses track of his son and doesn't know where that son goes or what he's doing. It's as if his son no longer exists because who knows where he is. But the father also loses, son, loses track of his eldest son, the eldest son who is loyal the eldest son who stuck by his father's side and worked with him on a, on a regular daily basis to keep that farm going. And they had to work hard to keep the farm going because they had just taken a big chunk out of it. And it was hard work to keep it up and successful. And that eldest son sticks by his father's side. And even as they are in close proximity to each other, the reality is, is that he... The father was losing track of that son, too. The story doesn't tell us, in the early part at least, the resentment and the bitterness that is building up in the heart of that oldest son. That oldest son resented the fact that his younger brother was allowed to take a big chunk, liquidate it, and go off and do his own thing while he stayed there and was loyal to his father. We find that out later after dad receives home the youngest son and throws a party for him. And now he can't find his eldest son, who has gone away because the bitterness and the anger is now coming to the surface. And that kid's been carrying that around for quite a while. 
And it's the father, the same father who welcomes home the son he lost track of by letting him go in an undisciplined moment. It's that same father now who has to go looking for the other son who is very resentful and upset about everything that has transpired. You know, when I was in seminary, we took Bible, we took theology, took pastoral care, took preaching, church history, took all those classes. That, that was the made majority of everything that I took in order to get ordained. Took Hebrew and Greek. The one thing that never happened in the three years that I was in seminary was a professor never walked into the classroom, put a typical church balance sheet in front of us and helped us try to figure out how to decipher it. I guess they figured that we would just leave seminary, go to our first church, and all the business people in the congregation and on the session would teach us how to do that would teach us how to decipher that stuff and understand the church balance sheet. And you know, and trust me, I've been in a number of churches, from church to church to church, the balance sheets all kind of are strange and look different from each other. Every church does it a little differently. And it takes you a few months to sort of look at the budget, and look at the balance sheets, and see exactly how this particular church does its financial stuff. And so maybe learning in seminary wouldn't have helped at all because it varies from place to place. And then these ministers who come out with all this teaching from seminary who sit down with a finance committee or a session can be very frustrating to the people who serve in those capacities because we come in and we look at numbers and we look at balance sheets and we're supposed to be in a finance meeting and we start asking theological questions about the numbers. Now who does that in the real world? Who starts asking theological questions in a bank meeting? But ministers come, what they bring to bear is not their financial wizardry. Let me trust, trust me, don't, never depend on a minister to get you through a finance crisis. Depend on the people in the church who know how to do it. But ministers come in to ask a different set of questions. What is the theological purpose of what we're doing and why are we doing it. So when I first came to Covenant Presbyterian Church, staring at some of the things that we were staring at, part of the question that I had to ask was, at the right time, why is the possession of land more important than that which God is now calling us to do as an entity that is different than we've ever been before. In essence, who is God now calling us to be now that our world has changed? And that's a conversation that the leadership of the church had to have, and that's a stewardship conversation. And it's an important one but it's different than just looking at balance sheet bottom lines. It's about who God calls us to be with the resources with which God has blessed us. Since we announced that we were going to have to try to attack the deficit, a question has come up, and I want to answer it right now, so, and you can share this with whoever's not here today so that we have an understanding about it. The question that came up was, how come if we're selling the property over there, we still got to worry about a deficit? And the answer is very simple. The property over there that we're selling was part of a mortgage that also involved adding on here. And all we're trying to do is reduce what we owe, but the thing is, we've still got a big challenge ahead whether we sell that property or not. The challenges that have come to us from the past continue to be challenges we must face for the future, and the challenges we face are the challenges of ministry rather than possession. The challenges we face is about understanding what God wants us to do with the blessings God has given to us for the sake of ministering to human souls 
rather than just possess and look big on McGregor Boulevard. The parable of the prodigal son, when we look at it as Amy Jill Levine has told us, is a parable about counting that is put together with two other counting parables. Is all about challenging us to ask the ultimate value questions about who we are in the faith. That it is a story about a father who finally finds himself and understands that life together as family is about relationship and not about assets. Even in the midst of the financial quarrels and struggles that were going on between his boys. And when he finds himself and recognizes what is really important in life, that empowers him and enables him to go back out there and find his sons once again and reel them back in to their family relationships. The son who left with a fistful of dollars and then comes home broke and broken. And he receives dad's unconditional love and grace because the dad had found himself in a way he'd never had before. And then the son who had stayed and been loyal and worked hard, who's now resentful, was searched out by his father in order to be able to share father to son his discovery about what is truly valuable in life. It is a parable about not possession, about relationship, teaching us that everything we do in the world with what we have has everything to do with building relationship in our midst and in our family. And friends, that's stewardship. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe.